Well, greetings, brothers and sisters out there. My name is Kevin. I am the Connections Director. Not the other Kevin, not Kevin Butcher, but Kevin <laughs> Who. And I also have here on the uh, the talk, Pastor William Mack. What's up, y'all? All right. So listen, if you clicked into this podcast, whether you're on YouTube or whatever podcast service you're using, you saw a title. And that title should say something like, Perfect Pastor, How to Be a Perfect Pastor. And... I will tell you, I Googled it because I wanted to know. I wanted to figure out how, but instead I got a list of kind of the general expectations of what a perfect pastor is. So, uh, Pastor Mac, before I, I throw this back at you here, I want to read a couple of these things. There's 12 things that Bible.org, there's like this little article here that, <laughs> that and it's, it's totally like satire or whatever it is, but... Um, but hear, hear me out, okay? Tell me if any of this kind of resonates with you or you feel this. Uh, the first one says, After hundreds of years, the perfect pastor has been found. He is the church elder who will please everyone. He preaches exactly 20 minutes and then sits down. Mm-hmm. Right. He condemns sin but never steps on anyone's toes. Ever. He works from 8 in the morning to 10 at night, doing everything from preaching sermons to sweeping. He makes $400 per week gives $100 a week to the church, drives a late model car, buys lots of books, wears fine clothes, and has a nice family. Mm -hmm. Let me skip down a little bit more, just these other ones. Uh, 36 years old, but has been preaching for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yep. He has uh, eyes of blue or brown and wears his hair parted in the middle, left or left side, dark and straight, right side, brown and wavy, whatever fits the occasion. Uh, Oh, he has a burning desire to work with the youth and spends all his time with senior citizens. Yes. Yeah, very good. Uh, The last one here. He makes 15 calls a day uh, day to church members, uh, spends all of his time evangelizing to non-members, and is always found in his study if he is needed. Yes. And then the last thing they wrote here was, unfortunately, he burnt himself out and died at the age of 32. (laughs) Boom. That's it right there. A source unknown. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Now... Uh, Pastor Mac and I were having a brief conversation right before we hit record on this one. Now, as I was reading through this list, there's a reality, of course, that I know for a fact that at some point in my own life, whether I embodied it or I heard it from someone else, like I know that some of this stuff, while said in jest, is true. Like there's a real expectation that we want our pastors, church leaders, but I'm going to say pastors, to be a little bit superhuman. And because we all have different needs and I want my pastor to meet a hundred percent of those needs. But what happens when your church is forget hundreds and thousands, if your church is 15 or 10, right. right now you've got 10 people with 10 different sets of issues and dynamics and families and they have their needs, but they all want a hundred percent of their needs met from their pastor. Mm-hmm. So that lends itself to we as pastors feeling like, we need to be all things to everybody at all times. And if we let anybody down, that feels like the world has fallen apart or we are no longer worthy of the posts or calling of pastor. Now, and I will add this, in addition to the reality that other people might be feeling this way, I sometimes just feel like I need to be these things. It's an expectation I have on myself. Because I have a certain view of my calling. I have a certain Mm -hmm. expectation of myself, of work ethic or whatever it is, okay? So here's the question that I would love to to kind of spend some time on and interacting with, especially when we give this to you first, Pastor Mac. What does it mean then to be rooted in the love of God while knowing that this stuff exists? Mm -hmm. That we have congregants that want this from us and we have our own expectations, but what does it mean to then be rooted in the love of God and and walk in in this world, this side of glory? Yeah, with this yeah, kind of so info. you started out with a really uh, uh, dope, light-ish post, and then you volleyed like the heavy thinking <laughs> question to me. I love how you just did that, right? No, but you know, here's the thing. I think when we are rooted in the love of Christ, that becomes our anchor and our identity. And our identity is that I am the beloved son, I am the beloved daughter of the Most High. When I understand that, when I embody that, yes, I recognize that there's a call that comes along with that, but I also am realistic because I know who and whose I am of what I can and can't do, 
right? Mm, okay. And I think the what's been crazy is I love this list. You know, uh, my favorite one is is that he is tall on the short side and heavy set in a thin sort of way, and he is handsome, <laughs> right? Not to mention the fact that like let's keep it all the way one hundred that she is not mentioned on here at all. Mm. So. That perfect passer clearly is always male wow. um, with all these crazy expectations. But I think what's crazy is that the institution of the church has created, whether they said it or not, some of these expectations, right? Mm-hmm. And that shapes how we see the call, how we see the position. Um, and so even though we know that this is a satire, there's still some light expectations that absolutely this is what we expect from our pastors. And for those of us who are pastors, this is how we should show up. And so right. that then causes us to feel a level of anxiety and guilt and shame when we can't. Right. Because life has just happened and we're human beings who have responded to the call of Jesus Christ. But to answer your question, to go back to your question, I think that remaining anchored in the love of Jesus Christ kind of also anchors us in our identity of who we are in him, what we can and cannot do. Um, and then we can start speaking to some of these unrealistic expectations uh, for what they are and not for what people want us to be and how they want us to perform. Because the love of God is not about performance. It's not rooted in how much you do and pleasing others. Um, but it is because it is because he is love and he's created us from that spot. And that's the spot that we lead from. Mm-hmm. That's really good. As you're sharing, I was thinking about how this can be pretty complicated and muddy sometimes as you're sitting with someone as imagine as you and Pastor Kevin Butcher are meeting with different pastors. Because I think for me, I started, you know, sharing this lightly. And I, I, you know, I say there's a lot of truth in it because I definitely have felt it from the outside. But I've also kind of, that voice is inside me as well. It may not even be true, some of these things, that what other people want from me. But I feel like it's what they want from me. Absolutely. Right. And so that just runs, that, that runs in my system. And so what I appreciate you sharing, kind of teasing out is, is you know, it's, first of all, I don't think it's even possible to be all things to all people, right? No, yeah. Yet, and this is what I mean, it's complicated. I want to glorify God and I want to do well. And so if I fail in any one of those particular categories, if I've got congregants who I've disappointed because I couldn't make it to whatever it is they wanted me to go to, if I didn't have the right answers, if I couldn't counsel in a particular setting, I didn't have enough experience in one particular area, it does make me feel like I am not glorifying God. Mm. I am not doing well. So it's not like one-to-one or easy to acknowledge as, oh, my identity is not in Christ. I don't feel deeply loved and cared for. But in my mind, the way it's initially it processes is I'm just not doing my job well. Mm. If, If I came at you right now and I said, Pastor Mac, that's what I'm feeling. That's what I'm going through. How would you direct me right there? Yes. So let me give you, let me give you this anecdote. I have a dear friend who serves as a pastor. Um, yeah, she serves as a Presbyterian pastor. Um, she, we joke all the time. She is almost 30 years my senior. And um, in her capacity, her church is like most of the churches in the United States going through this this um, very hard discussion as to whether or not it's time for them to close, okay? Um, Congregation has been dwindling for a while. They're in an interesting area in the city. Um, Congregation has gotten older, and so they can't do outreach and evangelism like they used to. And so they are really um, in a discernment process right now and praying through um, should they merge with another congregation or should they just close their doors altogether, sell the building or potentially turn the building into a community center? And we were sitting together and she's like, you know, if the church closes, I feel like I'm failing. I failed the church. And that broke my heart to hear her say that. And, I, and what I asked her was this. If you were a chaplain on a hospice unit your responsibility is to support that individual who's transitioning and their family to a loving, peaceful, through a loving, peaceful transition as much as possible. And then you provide aftercare for that family um, to give them the support that they need. We would never tell the chaplain, shame on you for letting your patient die. Hmm. 
We would never do that because that is their call. Their call is to respond to this individual who's transitioning and their loved ones, right? Somehow or another, we've made the pastoral call synonymous with you are to be all things to all people and you are to do it perfectly. And um, and then and, and all the time pointing people back to Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> and what's crazy about that is, is that it is the power of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ that endows us, that allows us to do what we do. But some things are just out of our hands. Some things belong to Jesus and they're not in our hands. And so when I don't get to show up the way that I think I should or I don't preach the way that I think it should have gone forward or the church doesn't meet these benchmarks that I think that I put in there, it really does. um, It shines a light on who the headliner is of our job. Right. At the end of the day, it's, it's what has Jesus called me to do in this moment? How has Jesus called me to show up in this moment? And how am I bringing Jesus to this particular moment? And even if it doesn't look like what I have idealized it to be, if I've shown up with Jesus, then I've done my job. Right there. There are sometimes we're going to leave those loved ones and they're still going to be crying. That doesn't mean that we didn't do our job. We just gave Jesus in that moment at that time. And we have to trust that Jesus is going to do the healing over time. And I think a lot of pastors do carry this extra weight on them that I've shown up as a representative of Jesus Christ, as a representative of the church, and I've shown the love, I've said the words, and the thing hasn't come to a nice, pretty conclusion like most things happen at the end of a 30-minute sitcom, right? That's not real life. And our adversary, the enemy of our souls, will try to shame us and guilt us and make us feel some kind of way about whether or not you're called, whether or not you are efficient um, in your calling because something hasn't come to a beautiful, peaceful resolution, right? Mm -hmm. God works in and through all of that stuff, but we're not promised that it's going to be a beautiful bow at the end of it or icing at the end of it. Like we're not, we're not promised that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow every single time. Um, So anyway, long answer to a short question, but I think that we have to remember that we show up with Jesus um, we respond to the call of Jesus Christ or what that outcome is going to look like all the time is not written in stone. It's not written in black and white that if you did this right, then it's going to look like this. And if you do it wrong, then it's going to look like that. No, we are people who walk in the gray um, and it is only through the love of Jesus Christ um, that we're able to continue walking one day at a time. Um, and even for those who are serving as pastors, you have you are dealing with the stuff that you're walking through as an individual And you're walking with people that you've been called to serve. And your call is to show up with Jesus where they are and to give them as much Jesus and give them as much love as you can Mm -hmm. in that moment so that they can continue on the journey. And then we pull ourselves out. Hmm. Yeah, it's really good. As you're you're sharing, I I just, I was like kind of going through my memory banks like, gosh, does it say in scripture or at least even out of the mouth of Jesus that we are to be all things to all people? Like, is there a way you can reinterpret that through some kind of translation where (laughs) Jesus goes, go forth and be all things to all people? Go forth. Yes. Yeah. Be bread, be wine. (laughs) (laughs) But there are very clear commands to trust in him. Yes. There are very clear commands to abide, not only just in his teachings, in his ways, but in his love. Yes. And as countercultural or counterintuitive as sometimes that feels like, because I want to get it done, I want to get her done, I got expectations right before me, the call is not to meet all those expectations. Mm -hmm. Somehow we were supposed to find our worth, our identity, our peace, our wholeness in the presence of God and in God alone. Yeah. And so, And how many times, and how many times do we see in the ministry of Jesus where Jesus shows up in love with truth and then he leaves it with the people? To make Mm. their decision. And some people were like, yes, I will leave my father and my mother. I will burn the fatty calf and I will come and I will follow you. And then there were some people, come here, rich young ruler, who was like, oh, well, in that case, Mm. I ain't going to be able to do it. I'm sure there was something in Jesus and his humanity that was like, you can do this. You can follow me. You can you can give away your riches and you can do this. But at the end of the day, the choice is yours. And we take on that weight. We take on that responsibility. We take Mm -hmm. on those things. 
because we have been told you have to be all things to all people because everybody that you hand out a Christian pamphlet to should come to your church. Right. That's right. Uh, and it, and it, and it, and, and, but it's just not realistic. It's not realistic. Mm-hmm. And, and, and those are one of the things that when I was serving as a local church pastor, I had to remind myself um, on a daily basis, like, God, where do we show up? Where do I show up today with you? Um, <laughs> really quickly, I had a pastor, um, a pastor's wife actually shared with me. He was seeing a pastor seasoned. He said that when he started his pastoral ministry, you know, every time the phone rang, he responded. Just every mm-hmm. time, just going, you know. So yeah. somebody's getting married, boom, I'm there. Baby need to be blessed, boom, I'm there. Somebody wanted me to preach, boom, I'm there. Somebody died, boom, I'm at the house. She said, I watched my husband. I think he was by vocational at the beginning of his pastoral career. She said, I watched my su- husband run himself rampant. She said, and I, I was watching him wear himself out. She said, and I knew that this was not going to end well. And it was starting to scare me, and I was praying about it. She said, and I would say something to my husband, like, you know, and he's like, well, hey, you know, what we discussed. That's my call, to respond to the calls. She said, one time, 3 o'clock in the morning, husband phone ring and she gets a call and he gets he responds to the call and one of the church members their mother had passed away mm-hmm. and he, she said what's going on he's like oh sister so-and-so just passed away and he gets up and puts his clothes on she says she stops and puts his hand on his chest and said lay back down she'll be dead in the morning wow <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And so most people, when I tell this story, even when I heard it for the first time, I was like, ah. But when we sat there and we talked with it, I was like, that's so real. And that is so true. Wow. Because yeah. I think every pastor in that moment was like, oh, we need to jump up, put on our cape, and we need to run out there and go do this thing, right? Because right, right. they need us in that moment. But yep. the truth of the matter is, she was like, look, I've watched my husband over the last month and a half kill himself to be everywhere. All things are all people. Sister so and so did not live in our town, so he had to get up out of his sleep, three o'clock in the morning, put on some clothes to drive to a neighboring town to be with the family whose mother who died, and literally there's nothing he can do but be there until the coroner arrived. And then what were they gonna do? They were gonna go back to sleep until the funeral home opened the next morning. And then so she was like, you know what? Let's call them back. Let's extend our condolences. Let's pray with the family. Let's check them in. She said, but honey, you're sleepy and I don't feel comfortable with you getting on the road. And mm-hmm. I think Jesus is okay with you not getting on the road right now. Mm-hmm. You haven't had good rest and it's three in the morning and you're about to drive to a neighboring town in the middle of the night. For what? You can still be present without necessarily being physically present. And anyway, I know there's some people that will probably hear this and go, no, nah, he should have got up and he should have ran out there. <laughs> well, you need to take it to Jesus to pray about it. But the reality is, and the whole point of the story is, is that we have to recognize our capacity and our realities at the same time and recognize that our job, if our job is to show up and be the love and light of Jesus Christ in the lives of our people where they are, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to be Superman and fly in, fly out. Um, to every place, every space that you're in, because there were even times that even Jesus didn't do that. All right. Wow. So, yeah. yeah, I would love to see the comment section after that. Somebody be like, oh, yeah. Matter of fact, put it in the comment section if y'all. Yeah. yeah. If, you're on, if, if you're on YouTube, there's a, if you're listening to this, there's a comment section. Yeah. If you're just listening to it, you're going to have to email. Uh, the email for any kind of critique or negative feedback, please send that over to William Mack <laughs> at. <laughs> All right. Well, well, brothers and sisters, listen, I wanted to, to, to wrap this up under the 20 minute mark, but I hope at, at some point, all of this, you, you found something encouraging. I know I did. Um, I think it's sometimes just therapeutic just to even talk this through and just name kind of the stuff that we do carry that we do here and just recognize that, you know, like it's, it's good to hear someone remind us that, you know what, y'all, this ain't normal. Right. Or it's normal, maybe, but it's not good. Yeah. It's not healthy. It's not biblical. Yeah. It's not what you and I were created to to do or to be. And to be and clear, so, we're saying that that's not normal. That that list is not normal. So <laughs> if you if 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 if, if <laughs> incoming pastor, that is your job description, run. And if amen the pastor, amen. Look at yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to say, don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. You can't. Sorry, you can't. normal in the in the sense that that list no, exists so. out there. Yeah. I'm being very so, much yeah. so. Most deaf. All right. <laughs> uh, Pastor Mac, anything else you want to say before we wrap this episode no. up? To all of our prayer supporters, thank you for praying for and with yes. Pastor Kevin and I as we've um, been traveling and sitting with pastors. And um, 
Thank you for your continued prayer. Thank you for your continued support. We love y'all so much. Amen. And um, we'll see y'all next time. God bless. All right.